Welcome to ZBooks Successful Authors Podcast. And with me today, I have the author of a new number one release in paleontology and several other categories. It's called Fossil Woman by Sharon Lyon. And Sharon Lyon is a geologist and science educator. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in geology from the College of William and Mary and a Master of Science degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Ms. Lyon has worked as a paleontologist, a petroleum geologist, and an environmental scientist. However, her greatest passion is teaching. And as a professor of physical sciences, she has shared her love of the earth sciences with her students at Howard Community College in Columbia, Maryland for over 25 years. That's some experience. Welcome, Sharon. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Eric. That makes me sound like I'm 100 years old. But thank you. About 25. 25 okay. years of experience. I've got 25 yeah. years of experience, so don't... Yeah. Where are you? I'm in Virginia, about two hours outside of Washington, D.C., in kind of a rural area. Mm -hmm. um, and a beautiful spring day finally here. Lovely, lovely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you got a new number one new release. Congratulations. Thank you. And I strategically uh, placed it by my shoulder. As you can oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to read that. That's a, a cool, uh, some cool copy you got there. A million years ago, humans walked the earth in tribes, their lives precariously short, their stories mostly untold. Aoife was such a woman. And her story is at the beginning of all things. That's pretty cool. Where, how did you think of that? Well, that's one of the threads in the book. Mm -hmm. So um, she is a Paleolithic woman. Um, mm -hmm. She lived in tribes one, one and a half million years ago. So she's of the species Homo erectus. She's only a small part of the story, though. The, most of the story is the other thread. And it's about a young woman who's growing up in the 1950s. Her name is Henrietta Ballantyne. And she's kind of a quirky, odd girl. She's homeschooled, but uh, she goes to the Smithsonian with her dad on Fridays. He's a paleontologist at the Smithsonian at the US Museum of, at the US National Museum, which is what the Smithsonian was called in the 50s. And she learns her love of fossils there. So most of the book is actually about her and it's uh, sort of a coming of age story of her growth throughout her childhood. And of course it's the 1950s and girls didn't become paleontologists for the most part in the 1950s. So it's a little bit of that sort of struggle also. So there's two storylines and they come together at the end. Uh, now I have to ask the obvious, are you Henrietta? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. <laughs> so okay. I'm not. I I, I um, am a little younger than that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but some, many of the places that she goes to in the book, I have been to. But and, I'm not in there. <laughs> okay. No, I didn't mean to do that to you. But let's yeah, no. beam up the next picture. Is so. Uh, there it is. So is this what got you into writing or, or what got you into writing? It's, it's, it's one of the things. So um, I'm a mostly retired geology professor. I'm still teaching one class a semester. But when I retired in 2019, I always I had this story in my head. Um, and um, I started to write it when I retired. And it was, um, it was a, more of a modern day story. And it was a, kind of a natural disaster story. Um, and then um, at the very end of 2019, I had some minor surgery. And when I came out of the anesthesia, I knew I had to write the prequel to that book, which is what became Fossil Woman. And my daughter told me that just means that I need to take more drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so I came out of the anesthesia and I just started writing. And two years later, you know, I finished Fossil Woman. But the postcard, I used to po collect postcards when I was a kid. And so the postcard was from the U.S. National Museum. That's their old, old um, dinosaur display. It's been redone and, again, just recently was redone. And they had Diplodocus there, um, you know, with his head up there on the balcony. And um, you could go, you know, touch him up there. So that is actually in the book. 
That's cool. And you were there in this picture. Well, it's a postcard. Oh, so yeah. I bought the okay. postcard when I went there as a tourist. You know, I, I grew up in Northern Virginia, so we would go to the Smithsonian quite a bit. Your your daughter said you need to take more drugs. Is she from California? <laughs> 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 Sounds like she's it. an outside the box thinker, though. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. That's important. That's important. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, yeah. yeah. So you were you you got the bug at an early age, huh? Right. Yeah. So I also always knew that I wanted to be a paleontologist. Now, I went to college in the 70s, so it wasn't so difficult. It wasn't like the str- more the, the struggle that Henrietta had in the 1950s. Um, but I also went to William & Mary. I went to William & Mary, and that's where she goes also. So some of that is, you know, from my own experience. Cool. So if you don't mind, I want to ask you about these pictures you sent me. Mm. What, what bone is that? Is that a brontosaurus? I, you know, I can't actually rem- remember that is from Dinosaur National Monument, and it is mm-hmm. one of the femurs, the leg bones that they have of some dinosaur, I'm not sure which, that they allow the tourists to touch. And where is that? Uh, dinosaur National Monument. What, what state is that? Yeah, I want to say Colorado. Okay. <laughs> and here, what, is, what are you doing there? You've got a hammer in your hand. Uh, I mean, kind of obvious. Right. But- so, so this is, this is in Wyoming, um, outside Kimmerer, Wyoming. Um, this is a quarry, it's, um, a quarry in the Green River Formation, which is famous for its fish fossils. And actually the, the fish on the cover comes from the Green River Formation. And there are a couple of quarries there that you can pay to go dig in. And my, my husband's also a geologist. And so we went out there a couple summers ago and uh, paid to dig in the quarry, dug in the quarry all day, and then shipped home 12 boxes of fish fossils, which some of them made it and some of them didn't make it very well, um, thanks to the US Post Office. But um, yeah, so we dug all day. And then I've spent you know, a couple of years you know, extracting them with finer tools. So it's kind of a hobby, um, but some of that is also in the book. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, um, that's tough to get uh, you know, a fossil out of a rock without uh, destroying it, right? Yeah, in, in some cases, yes. Um, yeah, the lamp, you could split these rocks. You can probably tell in the picture, you could split them along laminations pretty easily. But there was this one huge fish that was in a big boulder. And man, I wanted to get that fish out of there so bad, but I, it would have taken me all day just to do, get that one fish out of there. So I left it there. Uh, <laughs> the yeah, one that got isn't away. Isn't that annoying? The fish that got away. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's probably going to bug you the rest of your life. It now, will. You know? I have a picture of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. But 12 boxes was enough, I think. <laughs> How much did they weigh? Um, well, we used those, you know, those postal boxes that you can cram as many um, things in and it's always, it's all one price. Hmm. So, okay. you know, they're, they're meant for rocks, I'm sure. So hmm. I don't remember, but it, you know, the boxes hmm. were like that and we sent 12 of them. Where are you here? What is that? A fissure, some kind of fissure that probably has a, a specific date. You can probably tell how old it is or something. Well, actually, that's a river channel. So that's how a river channel is preserved in the rock record. And I think that was on a field trip that I took down in southern Virginia. I can't remember. I, I, I picked that picture because as my Howard Community College, I have my Howard Community College sweatshirt on. Um, ah, cool. That's what a river channel looks like. You can see you know, that you can actually see the channel shape. Yeah, so that was a prehistoric river, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So you could probably correct me on this. Dinosaurs were on the earth for something like 160 million years and 160 million years ago, or how was it? So uh, they were they went extinct 65 million years ago, mm-hmm. um, and they evolved 230 million years ago. Yeah, they were here a long time, weren't mm-hmm. they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Much Except longer that, than us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Much longer than us. Except That's for an, that darn comet. <laughs> yeah. So, the, yeah, the, that darn comet, man. <laughs> that darn comet. Black swan. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> But um, so how do they count humans? I've heard different ones. We've been here for 70,000 years, but it depends on which species you want to talk about. 40,000 years I've heard of. 
How right. long have have well? How do you count humans? How right, long? So if you if you look at Homo sapiens, uh, maybe twenty thousand to thirty thousand. But Efa in my book it was around at one point five million, and, and so I've already had people say, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, humans weren't around there." So she's an archaic human. Um, but what she is, is that? classified Homo as Homo erectus. Homo oh, erectus. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you told me that already. Sorry, I'm uh, jumping ahead. A, Sorry. <laughs> she is a, the genus Homo, so she's classified as an archaic human. Yeah. Okay, and when was Homo erectus on the Earth? It, she they actually lived for a long time, something like two million years to. Um, see, now you're really testing me. Like. <laughs> 20,000 maybe. I mean, they Homo erectus as a species live for a long time. And how tall and, were they? Um, on average? Uh, I, I don't think they were particularly short. I think they were as tall as modern humans. They had wow. long limbs. Yeah. And a, a smaller brain capacity, but long mm. limbs. Long okay, limbs. So, um, so tell us about Aoife and, and the story. Okay. So, so again, Aoife, she lives in a small tribe. She lives in what is now Olduvai Gorge uh, in, in Tanzania, it's now Tanzania. Um, but of course the gorge wasn't there then. So in the Pleistocene, 1.5 million years ago, there was a big lake there. And so all the ice age mammals would come down to the lake to drink and hunt. And of course humans were, uh, part of that ecosystem. So she was a, a part of a small band that would come down to that to that lake. And there was also volcanism. So there's a big caldera that's there and several volcanoes in the distance uh, along the area that um, that her tribe would have lived in. Um, so so the story kind of follows her everyday life a little bit and then she goes and joins another tribe and is it, the theme that I, runs through the book, part of the theme is how do women find their tribe? And so the same for Henrietta, how does she find her tribe and for Aoife and, and what happens if you don't fit into the tribe or how do you, you know, how do you fit in? And so that theme kind of runs through both stories. Uh -huh. And uh, well, I don't want you to give away your whole book, but then, well, what happens next? So um, the book actually goes back and forth in time. So I started when Henrietta is in Africa, um, which is sort of at the end of the book. Um, but she has gone to Olduvai Gorge, which is famous. I, it's a famous locality where the Leakeys um, worked. And uh, she meets Mary Leakey, who is her hero. And she did, and she's there to get fish fossils because this has become a bit of her specialty and her father's specialty. Her father is a specialty in fossil fish, but she also gets to hunt for fossil humans. Um, so, and then, so, and then there, and then um, it sort of goes back and forth. So then she goes away to college and then go, we go back to Africa and see what she's doing there. Um, and then of course you end up in Africa at the end. And at the time, Tanzania is changing governments. Yes, it is. So it was it was Tanganyika actually oh, yeah. Yeah. back yeah. then, and the British were leaving. Um, so I had to do a lot of you know research. Of course, some of it I've forgotten now. But, <laughs> but um, the Brit the British um, they were just they were voluntarily leaving and handing the country over um, to the people there. And they were they had a big ceremony where um, Prince mm. Philip went down there and handed it over. Hmm. Uh, and then they became their own country. Um, so it's um, Tanzania now, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm really into this uh, mitochondrial DNA. So have you heard of this book, mm -hmm. The Seven Daughters? You no, know, I hadn't heard of the book, but I need to read it um, now mm -hmm. that you had mentioned it to <laughs> me. Um, I had heard though of mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. So... I'm not a biologist, so, but um, in the mitochondria, in your cells, um, some circular DNA, and evidently this DNA is only passed down through your mother, from mothers to daughters. And so they can take this DNA and they can trace it back. Um, and they've 
traced it back to a single individual who they call mitochondrial Eve. And she lived, I believe about 200,000 years ago in East Africa, they think. Um, so, and of course, you know, naming her Eve was kind of controversial because of the biblical, you know, correlation. Mm. And she wasn't the biblical Eve. I mean, she wasn't the only woman alive on earth. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, th so that's where that comes from. Now, evidently the book that you mentioned, um, he's also done some fictional writing of the, of Eve. And so I need to read that. I have not mm. read that book. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty fascinating. I mean, it makes sense, right? Because a long time ago, uh, what there were like 40,000 humans or homo erectus mm -hmm. on earth and then mm -hmm. before that there were less right and so right? Yeah. it makes sense sure. that that your family tree gets smaller and smaller and smaller as sure. you and so right. Absolutely. yeah 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 in in the i also haven't read the whole book but you know they go mm -hmm. by these haplo groups you know and right. uh, yeah so there were seven and the seven daughters mm -hmm. are from yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And mm. Aoife, Aoife is your, your Eve, kind of. I guess so. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Because yeah. she, you know, she is successful mm -hmm. because she has a son, she survives, you know, that kind of thing. And so she, it, and, and that's what it took to be successful back then, not to not get, got, get eaten by a, a saber tooth lioness, you know, <laughs> which there were there. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah, but their lives were very short. You know, they didn't live very long. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I well, I I don't want to um, I don't want to, you to give away your whole story. But how how do you build the tension between the characters with Eve? Well, Eva? so um, there's a little bit of tension. There's a love story in the in the book too. So when Henrietta she travels out west with her dad and goes to the Green River Quarry, right? And they're digging up fish fossils and a group of men from Princeton come, a group of geology students from Princeton come and they dig in the quarry for a few weeks and she meets a, a man that becomes her love interest. So, but they don't really get along at first. Uh, you know, she considers him kind of obnoxious and he's always trying to test her and, you know, and again, she's the only woman out there, which is, you know, typical for her. Um, and then, but then the, the um, Princeton professors invite her to join them and ride back east with them. She had flown out with her dad. And so she joins them on this field excursion on the way back. And so she and um, Frank, his name, develop this relationship, but then they leave and she doesn't, you know, at the end, she doesn't hear from him for a while. And there's a lot of tension there. They also, you know, they, so they kind of disagree, but, you know, are still attracted to each other. Um, so there's a lot of tension in there. Part of it is that he really wants to work for a coal company and she detests that because she sees the environmental issues with coal. So, um, uh, and later in the book, he does work for a coal company and there's an accident. So those kind of things, I try to build tension in there with that. Interesting. Okay. What about um, Eva? Where... Um... I, I want to um, just say one more thing about Aoife mm -hmm. to get, uh, but not give away everything uh, so that, so that they know a little bit more about Aoife's storyline. Where, where do you want to leave her now? So, uh, well, there's definitely tension in her story because again, every tooth, claw, um, mm. you know, thorn, anything could just be fatal for her. So um, at one point, a saber tooth cat comes into the, their camp um, and um, they encounter, you know, all kinds of things as they're trekking. They do a lot of trekking. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, there's a, there's, a, there's a volcanic eruption and the volcanic eruption, all the ash will poison the grain of the Serengeti Plain what was the Serengeti plane back then? And so all the herds have to migrate and run from the volcanic eruption. And then she has to run too. So there's there's tension in that also. So there's I love natural that. disasters <laughs> as well as you know, ice age mammals. I love saber-toothed tigers. Uh, mm -hmm. are there any cave bears? 
No, she's too far south, no, isn't she? She's too, right. Cave bears are, would be like Neanderthal age, mm -hmm. and they yeah. were in Europe. So now yeah, okay. No yeah, that is so awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, then everybody's going to have to go read the book now, huh? To find out what happens <laughs> yeah. to Eva. Find huh? out what happens to her. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Right. Oh, I, I, I love that. I heard that. Um, well, I heard. I read. I don't know if it was saber-toothed tigers, but one genus or species of saber-toothed tiger uh, evolved the 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 teeth to be the exact size of a human skull. And so the argument oh. is that that's on purpose so that they can carry their human okay. things away and then eat them and stuff. You know. It, Could be. I, th I think I know they've had. A, they've found skulls with teeth marks in them yeah so. have you found any saber tooth stuff no i have not oh, okay no. that's okay no. that's okay yeah. what about that one um right behind your right shoulder it's blue is that a, a, a foot the one yeah. on your bookshelf yeah that one right, right behind you yep that's a that's a cast of a dinosaur footprint i actually live about 15 minutes from the quarry where a bunch of dinosaur footprints were found in the 80s Wow. And back then, and they allowed the public to go down one summer, you know, a, um, a whole stratum, a whole bedding plain was uncovered. Yeah. And um, so they had paleontologists come, they let the public go down there and take pictures. And, and they dug out some of them. Yeah. Um, so that's a theropod dinosaur. You can see the three toes with the claws. Mm -hmm. and there'd be one in the back with a claw. Yeah. A the theropod like a velociraptor. And um, so I'm actually thinking of writing a children's book about that because I have the photographs and there are a whole generation of children that I, you know, that I don't know that know about that, they, even that live in this area. So I'm thinking about writing a children's book about that. But um, they dug out some of the trackways and then winter came and with freeze thaw, it all broke up and, you know, it's no more. So other than the few ones that they were able to dig up, um, you know, the whole thing is gone now. That is so cool. So that was a velociraptor kind of dinosaur. Kind of, as a theropod, yeah. It was the genus K and Tapas, if that means anything. Yeah. But um, yeah. Not to so me. I'll, I'll look size. it up. Oh. Yeah, I'll look it up too. Um, not, about the same size as a velociraptor, you know, and a, mm -hmm. and a theropod. And then they found, they found a couple other dinosaur-like. Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily dinosaurs. One was like an alligator. Mm. Oh, like, I love alligators. I'm doing this because it was a quadruped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so they found some other creatures, but this was this with the dinosaurs. That is so cool. Yeah. I I strongly Definitely. urge you to write a children's book. That's my thing. That's my mm -hmm. my bread and butter. And um, oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know uh, what I always say to people? You know, um, some authors write books fifty thousand, hundred thousand words, and they ask me, "How much money do you make per word?" You know, <laughs> then I tell them, you know, my kids books, five, 500 words or less or, or, yeah. or more. And the one makes me maybe 500 bucks a month, you know, dollar a word. So <laughs> and next month it's going to do it again and again and again. So why write 50,000 words when you can write 500, you know, <laughs> I can do those children's you just got to, you got, well, you said you got the pictures. So I really, I really want you to make a, you can finish a children's book this year, you know. Mm. I've actually started writing the, um, write, writing the narrative, but, and I, yeah. I showed it to uh, my niece, who's a third grade teacher. And she said it was too hard. So I need well, to go back. it's true. You have to pick an age group. It's super important mm -hmm. because the age group in Amazon is, 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 if the moms and dads say that it's not appropriate to that age group, then you might get a, a bad review mm -hmm. or, or, a, yeah. So you have to pick the age group, but you know, you can make, for example, nine to 12 year olds and they read at a high level. And um, so that's kind of like my main age group okay. and uh, it works very well. I, I make books with um Air Force airplanes in them, very technical stuff. Okay. okay. So you don't have to go straight to the four-year-olds, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. 
Well, I was thinking of a picture book. Are they are yours more chapter books? Well, I have I have both. I've got mm -hmm. nine to twelve year olds, four to four to nine, four to well, see, yeah, it gets very granulated. Mm -hmm. It's like four to six years old, six to nine mm -hmm. years old, and then nine to twelve. And um, you can try to say, oh, it's from five to twelve, but you're really pushing yeah. it there, you know. And um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. Uh, if it's a picture book. Yeah, then then your challenge is the illustrations and the pictures, which um, I haven't seen your pictures, but you go on for the to five to nine years old, you don't even need more than 500 words. You put a picture in each page or an illustration on each page and 20 words a page and you're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's yeah. really awesome. Well, mostly they look like that. So <laughs> like uh, the footprint. Yeah, okay, well. But in the real rocks, so. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. I need a, more yeah. illustrations than that. You, yeah, maybe, maybe not. You, you can check out some of my books, but we can mm. geek out about that later. I okay. don't want to uh, <laughs> monopolize your time with, with uh, self-publishing here, but I did want to ask you why you wanted to be a paleontologist and how that morphed into writing. You know, I always, I, I was always fascinated by fossils at a really young age. I remember taking a vacation when I was in elementary school and we went to the beach, but there was a rock shop there and we went in there and I bought some fossils and that was the start of my fossil collection. Um, I still have somewhere the trial bite that I had in my early collection from that rock shop. And I was always fascinated by that. And then also in elementary school, a paleontologist came to talk to our class and he brought a dinosaur bone. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. So I, since I was a kid, I always wanted to be a paleontologist. And I read National Geographic magazine. I have, I actually have, this is one of my notebooks. At, as Henrietta in my book did, does, I hmm. made science notebooks and everything's coming unglued now, but I would cut things out of National Geographic magazine. This is the Leakies. And I was so fascinated with Mary Leakey because she was a woman who was digging alongside her husband and she was getting credit, which was just so unusual. She found a skull while her husband was sick and she was given the credit. And that was just so fascinating to me. So she was kind of a hero to me growing up. Um, mm. But so, so I always wanted to be a paleontologist, but I also really loved the idea of teaching. And when I was in graduate school, I taught um, labs, intro geology labs, like all the grad students did. And I loved that. So I knew eventually that I wanted to teach geology. So I wrote, I've written a lot of curriculum that no one's seen but my students. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I had never written anything, you know, really to publish that anybody ever saw other than my students. Um, so like I said, when I, but I always had that story in my head. So when I went to retire, that's when that, you know, I decided to start putting that down on paper. Yeah, cool. Cool. So you, you taught for 25 years, huh? I did. Yeah. Awesome. I, part of the time I was an adjunct um, and um, part of the time I was full time. And now I'm back to an adjunct again. Hmm. But that's okay. What, what's an adjunct? <laughs> so an adjunct is a part time teacher and you're paid per class. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of hard, huh? Mm -hmm. It is hard. A lot of people start out that way, though. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, what's your number one uh, memory or, or question from students you got during that time? Oh, that's hard. Number one question. Did you ever have to kick a student out? You know, I never did, although some students had challenge, more challenges than others. I do remember the worst teaching night I ever had, worst mm. class I ever had. And I know every teacher has one. We were using these sun earth models where we have the sun and the earth and you move the earth around the sun and the sun and the earth spins and the, it tells the seasons up along the bottom. And I, you know, I had the whole lab that I had written based on these things and they were brand new. And we, I had one old one. And so I made the lab based on this old one that was fixed. Well, the new ones, you had to set them yourself beforehand. And I didn't know that. Oh. 
So I got into the class and we have these models and I didn't know that I had to set them beforehand. And I'm saying, so let's set them on the vernal equinox or whatever it was. And we'll turn off the lights and you should see that the little light, you know, from the sun will shine right on the equator, right? And they're like, no. <laughs> uh -huh. I was so flustered that I could not figure out what was wrong. Yeah. And I finally figured, oh my gosh, they're all different. They were all different because I hadn't set them. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. So that sticks in my memory. Honestly. It's one, of the, one of my work. You know, every teacher I think has one of those where it's just like a disaster. That's the, um, um, <laughs> that's the, what, what do they call that? The, 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 that technology effect when you're, you know, you're showing yeah, I guess. the yeah. Bill Gates or the Microsoft effect. I don't know. It was an epic fail. I'll, I'll yeah. Say I'll yeah. That. But, you know, I had great students. I taught at a community college and I had wonderful students, um, you know, a few exceptions, right? Um, just this past Monday, I had to turn a student in for plagiarism and I hate that. Um, but, you know, generally I just had, I had great students and, you know, over the 25 years, every once in a while, they'd write me a thank you note and I kept them. And when I retired, I went through and read them every once in a while. Awesome. And, you know, the thing is, I, I, as I was reading them, you know, I couldn't really, because it had been a long time, I really couldn't picture the students necessarily in my mind, but I decided that that was okay. Because, you know, I had touched their life and they had touched my life at that point, And that was my job then. And then they moved on to something else and that was okay. But it's, it was a, it's a, was a great job. It really was. That's cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, Teaching is an important job too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a calling, not a job. That's great. So <laughs> yeah, because then you're actually having meaning in your life and your job. Mm -hmm. And um, not everybody does that, you know. So I no. think that's great. Yeah. But a lot of people do. I mean, I think, you know, you know, obviously um, a lot of people are called to their certain profession, but teaching is definitely one of the one mm -hmm. of them. So is that um, lady paleontologist that you just mentioned, is she your favorite author? Mary Leakey? Yes. Um, so Mary Leakey is deceased. I have read her autobiography, um, but I wouldn't say she was my favorite author. I am a pretty voracious reader. Hmm. So I, and I read all different kinds of things. Um, anything by David Baldacci. I love that. Um, I read a lot of historical fiction. Mm -hmm. So um, I just read the other Einstein about Albert Einstein's first wife, who was a mathematician um, by Marie Benedict. Um, I, but I read nonfiction too, Lab Girl by Hope Yarn. She's a, she's a mm -hmm. uh, paleobotanist. Okay. Uh, oh, these are all new names to me. This is cool. Keep going. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um one you might like, since you, um, just from what you said, is um, John Gilchrist, who's a local author here in Virginia, but he's had quite a bit of success with it. He has sort of a Soldier of Fortune, Jonathan Graves series, hmm, Soldier of Fortune with a Heart. And mm -hmm. I actually went to William and Mary with him, but I didn't, I don't know him. We didn't know each mm -hmm. other, but since, since I've, I've discovered his books by accident, I found out that we went to William and Mary together in the same year. Cool. Um, but you might like his books. Yeah. Um, Do you have yeah, a favorite so book? It's usually whatever I happen to be reading at the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so not really. <laughs> mm. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And you, well, tell me about the natural disaster movies you like. Oh, I love natural disaster movies. So um, everyone makes fun of me, but I love the movie The Core. Have you ever seen that movie? No, it sounds like it's something an, I should know, though. It, it's an old, it, it's it, well, not tremendously old, but um, it's with Hilary Swank and Aaron Eckhart before they were really famous. And the idea is that the core of the earth has stopped spinning. So the electromagnetic field around the earth is breaking apart hmm. and they have to tunnel to the mantle core interface in a ship. Hmm. And with nuclear bombs, reset the core to spin, the outer core to spinning. Anyway, it is it's so ludicrous. And yet, I love that movie and I can almost recite all the, the core, huh? Yeah, I but the core. 
And I used that, to share with my class the day before Thanksgiving break. <laughs> that, that's a good point because isn't it so that we can't explain how these huge dinosaurs could even stand like a brontosaurus. So the theory is that our gravity was less back then because the core of the earth was, I don't know, warmer or uh, liquid. And <laughs> yeah, because yeah, no. for, do you know anything about that? Because no. for example, an elephant. They, they yeah, used to think that that some of the some of the uh, you know the the big brontosaurus diplodocus dinosaurs must have lived in water because they were so huge that yeah. they couldn't possibly have lived in land, so they had to have lived in a swamp and kind of semi floated. But then they found many many trackways of these yeah. animals, and so they they could stand on land. <laughs> yeah, but it, it it's it's strange because a modern elephant he can't even sit or lay down on his side; he'll suffocate you know, and they can't sit for more than like 20 minutes or they'll suffocate. And, and so when you see all these National Geographics and these nature movies, when they're, when they're uh, what do you call it, tranquilizing the elephant, mm -hmm. they have to wake him up over. in a certain time or else his own weight will collapse his lungs. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so it's a mystery. How could something 90 times bigger than an elephant even walk? Because mm -hmm. the gravity Today's gravity would supposedly just, just, it wouldn't be possible for a brontosaurus to live in today's gravity. But it's, I mean, if you can solve that, you'll get a Nobel Prize. Maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> so I've given you two challenges. Write the kids' books and solve uh -huh. the mystery and of solve gravity. solve that mystery of diplodocus. <laughs> they can be so big. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to so do a follow-up podcast. I want I want a full report in the morning. Okay, I'll be writing that up for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what other d natural disaster movies do you like? You know, the the one that uh, that I that I like that's actually I think fairly accurate is uh, Dante's Peak. Oh. Pierce Brosnan. Have you ever have you seen that one? Again, that's not a new one, but um, but the depiction of the volcano and the explosion and it's an eighties you know, movie, that isn't kind of it? Thing. Huh? It's from yeah, the 80s. Probably. Right, probably. Yeah, I've but, seen um, everything from the 80s, but can't remember it. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Well, that was pretty accurate, except for the fact that they outrun the pyroclastic cloud in a Jeep, mm. Mm. <laughs> which probably isn't true. But, um, mm. but the, just the depiction of the, because it was around the time of Mount St. Helen. So they had a lot of film of that. Yeah, that, that was, was 80s like. for sure. Yeah. 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 That was 1980. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was crazy. I remember that. Yeah. My, um, my cousin lives in Alaska, and at the time, I think mm. she lived in Oregon. So, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, boy, yeah. The, the photos of Mount St. Helens are breathtaking. They are, especially from that little, there was a little plane that was flying around it when it exploded. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the film from that, I can't imagine being in that plane, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah, amazing They were stuff. right up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, yes. all right. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'm going to reach into the grab bag and, and grab okay. some random ones. So what's okay. your number one productivity or life hack? So you're a teacher. You probably have a bunch, huh? Life hack? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Or productivity well, hack, whatever. Okay. Well, um, I do yoga every day. Mm -hmm. So, But um, I actually live on a lake. Hmm. Um, so I can look out my window here and see the lake. And so there are a lot of days that, you know, I'm just not getting any writing done and I'm done grading papers. And so I take a float down to the lake and just sit in the water or sit on the dock or whatever. It's really beautiful down there. So that's yeah, awesome. Getting in the moment, huh? Getting in the. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And I tell you, if I'm, I'm not an early morning person, but if I am up early, um, we have kayaks down there. I'll take a kayak out on the lake when no one else is out there. And it's so beautiful and peaceful. That That's so you and the turtles. You're inspiring me now. I got to move back <laughs> to the beach. I used to live 100 meters from the beach in Huntington Beach. Oh, when I lived in yeah. California. Now I live 100 miles from the beach. I got <laughs> to move back to the water somehow. Uh -huh. yeah. You kind of answered my other question. Do you, do you have a morning routine? Yeah, I always get up and get my Earl Grey and do like 45 minutes of yoga every morning. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hey. at the age where I really need to stretch. <laughs> I'm an Earl Grey fan too. Madam Grey, Earl Grey. 
program. And what, what style of yoga do you have a specific? You know, I, I, every once in a while I take flow class. So mm -hmm. it's just flow yoga or whatever I feel like doing that day. Do you know the five Tibetans? No. Oh, well, they're supposed to re restore youth. And um, oh. they're very, okay. um, what do you call it? Primal yoga, primordial yoga from mm -hmm. Nepal. Um, and well, oh. you might want to look them up. Um, oh, okay, I'll it, look them up. Yeah, you. It's... I can use all the restoring of youth, though. <laughs> Yeah, you can't see it, but I, I have my um, my video camera turned on 100 percent to, to, you know, uh, redo my skin. So <laughs> it's a setting in Zoom now. Zoom is so awesome. I, I should have bought stock. There's a setting. In I know, right? We all should have. Touch. Before yeah. Oh, don't you hate that? Oh, man. Before 2020. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, OK. My favorite question. If you could eat dinner with anyone, past, present, or future, who would it be? I'd have to go back to Mary Leakey. I hate to keep repeating my, my question. No, but, you know, I, at, when I read her autobiography, you know, I, as a kid, I, I looked up to her. I thought she was so great. And and she, and I still do. But, and she and Louis Leakey were working together and Olda Gorge and, you know, side by side and their three sons and everything. Well, when I read her autobiography, I found out that Louis Leakey, was uh, quite the womanizer and didn't treat her very well. And uh, they, you know, they separated it several times. And, um, you know, it wasn't the idyllic um, situation that, you know, I pictured, you know, from seeing them in National Geographic. So I would love to have dinner with her and ask her about that. She, she actually, you know, she comes forward in her autobiography and talks about it some. Cool. Um, so I'd like to talk to her and see how it was for her and, you know, good, good and bad thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 A lot of, nobody ever says I would meet somebody in the future, like the future leader of the mm -hmm. world. It's always going back, oh, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Now back to that mitochondrial DNA, huh? If we go back far enough, then <laughs> probably <I> can't. <laughs> can't speak the language though, huh? Right. And, you know, I guess I could have dinner with Aoife, except, you know, and in the book, mm -hmm. I do have that they have fire, which I've pushed fire back, I think, a little bit farther than the fossil evidence. Um, of course, the evidence for, for fire is charcoal and they were real. There were fires. So it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to tell when. I heard it 70,000 years, fire. right? Huh? 70,000 years ago, we started controlling fire or something like that. Yeah, they, they don't know because there's evidence that it could have been longer ago than that. Mm -hmm. They do think Homo erectus that as a species used fire. Um, I mean, I've seen some things that say even back 2 million years, they think maybe they used fire. I don't know. In my book, one and a half million years, they used fire, but okay. you know, controlled fire. Do you know when- so I guess I could eat dinner with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can eat dinner with them. You just couldn't really communicate with them probably. Well, that's you know? true too. Exactly, exactly. Do you know when we or which species started really talking? I don't think they know that either. So in my book, she has very primitive language. I do think that I've read that they think language started by um, imitation and mimicry of things in nature. Mm -hmm. So I sort of have them doing that in my book book and i listened on on youtube to um some of the click languages mm -hmm. from africa that still exist they're very interesting hmm. and in the click sounds um and i i imagine that some of ifa's uh speech has that in it too that is that is so cool it's uh super interesting because um well there's one theory that cro magnon or homo sapien sapien uh, mm -hmm. one against the Neanderthals because of communication. And they mm -hmm. said, Maybe. well, yeah, but Neanderthals could probably speak, but okay, mm -hmm. can't really prove it, huh? And um, Right, yes. So I don't think they really know. You know? Yeah. I think yeah. they've tried to look at the bones of the throat and try to figure that out. Yeah, Maybe. yeah. yeah. But yeah. I heard that they finally did figure out uh, definitively that cro -Mags uh, did breed or what do you call it? Mm -hmm. uh, mm, uh, intermarry? I don't know. In, in, uh, with Neanderthals. Right. With Neanderthal, right? Because modern humans, they can tell have some. Some people have part of Neanderthal DNA still. Yeah. Which fascinating. is fascinating. It is fascinating. I don't know how they do that, but 
Hmm. You know, so obviously they did interbreed. Hmm. Yeah, and then we then we go back to our idea of species. So were they two? You know, we define species as um, you know two different you know different organisms that can't interbreed and produce viable offspring or offspring that can reproduce, not viable, but that can reproduce. So obviously they did. Mm-hmm. So were they, you know, were they different species or not? Right. That's right. If you cross a tiger with a lion, they, they could have children, but they won't uh, be able but to. They won't breed. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, hmm. um, but evident, but evidently we did, you know, yeah. they did interbreed. So. Yeah, my uh, a lot of my family members did 23 and me and they come back with them some mm. freaky stuff like you have maybe 0.1% Neanderthal genes which mm-hmm. might or does describe your jet black hair and your allergy uh or or your hay fever, you know. And so, okay. Uh-huh. Or your okay, ability right. to sneeze or cough. <laughs> yeah, they come off with some really off the wall stuff. Um Oh. Yeah. Interesting. But yeah, yeah, and and, uh, they, I don't know about 23andMe, but uh, they tied Neanderthal genes to very dark black, jet black hair. And uh, really, oh, interesting. In my my, uh, relative's profile. And I won't say the name or or which relative, because it might kill me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Gee, thanks for saying that. (laughs) Oh, I'm dead. (laughs) Okay. What's the one question you wish people would ask you, but don't? Hmm. (laughs) Maybe I'll go back to something you said. Mm -hmm. Professor Lyon, could you explain to us how, um, how, what your project was to win that Nobel Prize? Ah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I like that. How about that? (laughs) That's, you're making a deal with your future self now. I like that. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. So, so um, your book's on sale right now, right? It's for sale. If it, it's uh, free with Kindle Unlimited, mm-hmm. and um, it's in paperback. And I just signed a contract today with a young woman who's going to do the audio book for me. Nice. I just nice. Love her, her voice. She's actually a high school student mm-hmm. um, in Minnesota. Excellent. And she's yeah. going to do. Um, the audio book for me. So that should be coming in at the end of April. Lovely, lovely. Yeah. Audio books are great. I'm a, I'm a big mm-hmm. podcast and audio book fan. I do that more than I read nowadays, you know? Yeah. And uh, so uh, yeah. where can we reach you online? So I have a website. It's SharonLyon.net. Okay. Yeah. So that's the best way. Um, I'm on Instagram at um, Fossil Woman Author. Mm-hmm. And I'm on Pinterest as fossil oh. woman author. Okay. Um, I'm on Facebook, but I keep my Facebook personal. So I use my Instagram for my book. Um, and I have an Etsy shop, but my book's not up there quite yet. So, but I think by Christmas time, I'll have my book on Etsy. Really? You're going to sell it through Etsy? You know, you're the second the person back. that's told me that. And I thought you sold um, like, a PDF or, or physical stuff. How are you going to do that? How does that work selling through Etsy, a book? Um, well, Etsy, of course, takes a percentage, but uh, I can sell the paperback because it's, you know, Etsy is homemade things and also vintage things. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't sell the ebook because I'm on Kindle Unlimited. So I'm with Amazon mm-hmm. for that, but I can sell um, the paperback. So are you going to physically send it to them then? When then I have to physically send it to them. So I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of, uh, I might also have some mugs made that just say Mm. fossil woman with just the um, logo. Cool. Yeah. And sell them as a set for Christmas. We'll see. Yeah. Because I was seriously thinking about that too. And I was thinking, can't you use the author copy function in Amazon to Mm -hmm. send people a book directly from Amazon? No. So you can only send them to yourself with the, uh, for the author copies, but then you, okay. can, you can resell them. But again, Etsy does take a cut. Hmm. You know, so. so we'll see. That's just an idea I'm throwing around. Yeah, let me know how that goes, because I was thinking yeah. of doing that, too. The yeah. problem is I'm in Germany, so that, that's, that's why I was, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. All yeah right. and for Etsy, you can set it, but you only will sell within the continental U.S. for me, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that okay. I wouldn't 
mail things overseas. Yeah. All right. Did, what about your future projects? Um, so other than the children's books that I'm thinking about, um, I want to go back to the novel I started, which is the sequel um, to Fossil Woman, and it's actually modern day. So the character is the granddaughter of Frank and Henrietta from Fossil Woman. Um, and again, it's going to be more of a dis- nat- natural disaster book. So I started writing that in 2019. I need to go back and read it. <laughs> Part, you know, I wrote scenes. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so I need to go back and read and read them and see what I wrote and um, try to put that together. So that's cool. my next project. Awesome. Well, let me know when you're done with it. Oh, okay. I will. I will. Okay. Hopefully, it's... it won't take me another two years. <laughs> uh, it shouldn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> Famous last words, but yeah. <laughs> Well, let me know if you need help on your kids' books, your children's okay. books. I can definitely help you with that. And uh, oh, okay, great. Yeah, great. it's been wonderful talking to you. I could I could talk about geek out about this stuff forever. I I love paleontology, archaeology. What is that other one with humans? Um, human paleontology. Anthropology. And, yes, that one. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's been wonderful. Yeah. So thanks for coming along. And um, well, thank you, know, you so much for having me. I really appreciate you having me on and. Um, let me plug my book. Yeah, um, well, let me know when you, your next one is ready and we'll do it again. Okay, I will. Okay, right. thank you. All right. Thanks, Eric.